Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Today, we have our favorite topic, the primary vision for spread count. And then we're going to go into a little bit of color on why we continue to see some pressure on exports and what's happening in the world now that we've had a, a little bit of additional data uh, come out. And then, you know, next week, we're going to have another uh, big show. Uh, you know, we have the election, which is going to be fun. Don't forget to vote. And then we'll have our EIA show, the economy show, and then obviously our favorite, the primary vision uh, frac spread count. So before we dive in, uh, again, please remember, like, subscribe, share. You know, we, we, we're trying to get out there. You know, anything that you can do to help us would always be appreciated. So without further ado, uh, the primary vision frac spread count is 127. So we actually went down seven from 134 from the uh, previous week. Now, this may sound exciting because, you know, we, we had some uh, the uh, rigs go up overall with about, I think it was nine up in the uh, in the Permian, about 10 across the oil space. But just to, just to clarify, because, you know, we obviously we did go down by, by seven, but we have to appreciate that the, the, this makes up all the different basins. So when we look at the different basins, you know, we've we've actually seen a, a pretty steady increase in oil. And a lot of this drop was really driven by uh, natural gas, and we did get some reduction in the Williston. And, and just to give you an idea of, you know, just because we want to try to take some time and actually show and, and highlight how good our data is and what, what kind of uh, depth you can get, you know, just to look at people who have been operating over the last 45 days in the Williston itself, it's been Conoco, Hess, Marathon, uh, Slauson, WPX, uh, Petrohunt, you know, Enterplus, you know, these... These are the kind of, of things that we're looking at. You know, we, we can go through Halliburton, some other different, uh, you know, liberties up there. And we, we the, you know, these are things that we're trying to show and trying to highlight because obviously it's important for the, for actually getting the stuff into a pipe and, and to the end user. So the, just to kind of, you know, uh, do a quick outline in terms of where we are right now. So, you know, here's just the last three months, we can see that we've gone down from, you know, we peaked at that 134, c came back a little bit. And it's just important to highlight, you know, we've been talking about how we were going to start to see a little bit of a slowdown as some work gets completed. We had some of the smaller basins have some uh, work drop off. You know, we've had some uh, some natural gas spreads fall off. And then, we, you know, again, the Permian remained strong. We had another increase in the Permian. Uh, the Bakken pared back a little bit. But again, now it's we're in maintenance mode. Now the idea is how do we bridge this gap into not only just 2020, you know, Q1 of 2021, but how do we try to get through the first half of 2021 without significant decline curves? And that's really kind of what the focus is here and, and what's really being uh, driven as we go into the end of the year. And just to give you some kind of comparison into uh, 2019, you can see that you know there's a, there was a little drop at the same time, but ag again, it's kind of hard to compare last year to this year, just given the shifts that we have in the market. And then obviously we have the pressure that we've seen over the last couple of days in pricing. So these are some of the, the, the components. You know, we continue to, to remain uh, confident that we're going to stay within this range. You know, clearly, I, I, they've, the, I'm, I'm fairly bearish the price of oil into the end of the, into the end of the year, but yet we've, we, you know, they've, a lot of these guys have outpaced even my expectations. So just given where we sit, we'll probably uh, hang within this, uh, within this range of call it, you know, about 125 to about 135, just as we have some work come back, some work fall off, you know, as we have guys managing their, their portfolios and uh, just looking at rig counts, because we did get a request to talk a little bit more about rigs, you know, rig counts, we think are, are going to continue to go up. You know, some guys have a little bit of budget left within the year. So they're going to try to get some of these, these wells drilled in 20, uh, in 2020 with the idea that they'll start to get completed in different parts of 2020, uh, 2021, because you really want to try to get to a place where you're comfortable with some running room. You're going to try to look at, to get and drill in some of your better acreage to try to bridge some of this gap because you do have interest to pay. You do have firm transport. You do have a lot of things that have to be managed as we go through the remainder of the year. So when we when we look at what's happened, you know, uh, clearly in the EIA show, we talked about the hurricane, you know, this is just an update. Right now, as of uh, Friday at 415, the oil 
uh, shut in is about 1.3 million barrels a day, 1.226. So right now there's obviously still some some down, but this will continue to ramp up over the the coming uh, few days. But just to give you an idea of as we go into the EIA show and kind of what's going to look, what things are going to look like. The draws uh, will be a little bit, a little elevated, obviously, because we've lost uh, some decent production coming from the Gulf of Mexico. But we also did have two facilities have power outages, so those were uh, were impacted. So there will be some drop in the refinery run rates as well. So it, it'll just kind of work itself out. Again, this is something that we've talked about. It'll just be a timing delay. Uh, there's another hurricane that could that is a potential. It could be the record setter in terms of the most named storms ever. But you know, we'll see how that how that turns around you know just to kind of go through some of these daily indicators they continue to uh, to worsen you know we talked about this in the economy show and we went in greater depth but this is just gonna a quick high level in terms of the pain that we're seeing in germany france spain you know, obviously we have the lockdowns italy again same thing uk similar you know the ones that are remaining on the outside are japan and norway in terms of kind of maintaining this this steady growth and we're going to talk about a, uh, japan a bit in a bit more depth uh next week just because we had some decent data points and that we can look at and try to extrapolate forward the uh, the bigger issues like belgium just announced their own lockdown you know so the demand is going to continue to roll over when we look in europe and the us continues to kind of bump along at this at this comfort i'd say a comfortable level of about 75% the pressure's already kind of been baked in when you consider the rise in cases so i don't really see too much more downside from where we currently sit but again we have some uh some declines that we've seen over the last few days in terms of just uh, gasoline. Now, just looking quickly at the global entity, you can see that there's been a little bit of a divergence between emerging markets and advanced economies. And again, we talked a lot about this uh, in our economy show, but just to, to re rehash and reiterate, the advanced economies have continued to fall, and it'll start to pull down and act as a, as a weight on some of these um, emerging markets because, again, a lot of the raw materials, some different um, impacts, come, you know, the trade will originate from those emerging markets, so they'll start to see some pressure overall. And then globally, you can see that things are just kind of hanging sideways. And then China, you know, we've talked about Chinese numbers, but, you know, the, the bigger issue is what's happening at the banking side. You know, we just had the Congress. We're, we're going to dedicate a whole segment to what 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 is the outcome of the five-year plan just to get an idea of what, what can we expect coming forward. Now, you know, one of the things that we always highlight on the EIA show, specifically in the second segment when we go through demand drivers, you know, we've been highlighting just the strength overall in trucking versus the, the issues that we continue to see on the gasoline side. And this was, I thought, a, a really good visual just to give you an idea of how trucks continue to, uh, to be the, the stalwart and ways to move inventory throughout the, uh, the country. And just the actual car traffic remains depressed. And, and as we've been saying, it's just going to kind of be sideways where trucking will remain uh, fairly robust. And as we go through the seasonal period, we always see, see, you know, seasonally speaking, car miles go down. So the question is then going to be, what does is, what is Thanksgiving look like? Because Thanksgiving is a huge travel uh, travel holiday. And again, anecdotally right now, we'll start to get more data points, but we know people who are canceling Thanksgiving. You know, they're staying within their nuclear family. So this was is going to be something that's going to be impactful to overall just miles driven for that period of time. Now, to, you know, not only are we talking about what's happening within the U.S., but when we go abroad, you know, Angola and Norway have uh, have announced some of their loading schedules. Norway has been fairly stable. There's not too much to say one way or the other uh, with the, uh, you know, Johan, uh, Johan uh, uh, Fer as fair drop, uh, the that location that um, facility uh, basin is now up and running. Uh, it's it's at a new record, but it's just really kind of offsetting some of their other declines. So it's nothing really to to say one way or the other. Angola has a, has has had a little bit of an increase, and the increase is because we do see speculative buying in China, and that's being uh, that's a benefit for Angola, where about eighty to eighty five percent of their crude will end up. Where Nigeria, it's is having a divergent path because Nigeria typically sells a significant amount into Europe. 
and clearly Europe is struggling. So now we've seen actually some, some fairly significant uh, drop-offs in Nigerian sales where, you know, so far the planned announcement for December is going to be down 10%. Uh, we, we still don't have the full uh, backdrop, but when it'll come out next week, and then obviously we'll talk about where, where you know, what, what are those differences. And at this point, we've actually seen a, a, a pretty decent drop in Nigerian um, official selling prices. So the, the November official selling prices for Bonnie and, uh, and Kiwa are to their weakest level in five months. Again, trying to move and trying to compete. Now, this, this will benefit India because India is a growing entity in terms of uh, some of their refining capacity, which we talked about in the EIA show, and we'll go through in a, in a bit more detail. But at this point, we, we've seen a lot of storage. Uh, China's actually been reselling some of their oil to try to free up some storage terminal space, and they, it's gone to Myanmar and uh, South Korea. So we're going to continue to see some of these movements over the, uh, the near term. But it's something to, to, to point to when we consider what's happening in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia announced uh, total reserves. They were down month over month. Uh, you know, this is just a chart to kind of look to, to kind of show how they've been fairly stable at these levels. But the bigger issue right now is just the the inherent pain that we're continuing to see across the board in terms of just pricing. Because if Saudi Arabia is seeing a decline in total reserves, well, I mean, we already know that Iraq essentially can't cover 75% of their spending. Nigeria is something similar. So these are the kind of things that we're looking at when we consider, well, if I can't get it in price, can I get it in volume? And can I kind of close that gap? And the other way that they're trying to do it is... It, instead of selling oil, trying to sell a higher value product, which is just refined products. So, but <laughs> yes, European imports of oil products from the Middle East uh, are at the highest level in two and a half years. You know, we've been talking about this in terms of those imports that have really shown up. About 40 tankers of middle distillate so far have gone to the, from the Middle East into Europe across the month. And we've seen that reflect in, in onshore storage, but th- some of those things are starting to slow down. But we do see more activity with, uh, with additional flows coming from uh, the Middle East and, and Asia into Europe. And just to kind of give, put some numbers to what are, we, what are we talking about or thinking about when we look at the official reserves in Saudi Arabia, they fell by about 1.68 trillion uh, reals. Um, you know, the reserve was down about 11% versus the same time last year. Gold remains consistent with really the foreign exchange, uh, foreign reserves down, you know, pretty much about 10% across the board, which is going to be a bigger problem, especially if we continue to see the weakness that we expect to see. Now, just a, a, a quick reiteration, you know, we talked about Australia and the issues that Australia was having, and now it's official. So BP will cease fuel production at one of their, refi- at their refiner in Western Australia. And they're going to actually convert it into a uh, a port and loading facility, and it's just it, it, it's important to appreciate what that what does that mean because there was only four refiners to begin with, so now there's three. So there, it, the government's now talking about ways to maybe subsidize or provide some sort of incentive to keep those three alive because it's just the margins don't work. Now, losing this facility, which to be fair, wasn't operational, so it just becomes more permanent at this, uh, becomes permanent at this point is what is going to happen with some of the Malaysian crew, some of the Nigerian crew that typically will end up in Australia. You know, this is just going to have to be absorbed somewhere else, which is why we always want to look at and talk about what is happening in, in Asia itself. So the top chart here looks at the, um, the, um, the amount of super, uh, you know, whether it be VLCCs or, UL, uh, or ULVCs going into China, and you can see that it's increased and it's, and it's on its way back up. And now, there's two reasons um, why this is happening. Is One, you have speculative buying where you have guys that are looking to, because right now we still haven't gotten import quotas, so there are guys trying to front run, taking advantage of some of the softness in pricing, see if they can pick something up, get ahead of it. And then others that are, you know, we do have some some facilities within China that have been buying on the SOE side. We do have the new facility firing up. So this is also going to be uh, factored in here. But it's important to appreciate now where Asian crude floating storage was in comparison. So you can see as we got that big spike in movements, we also got that big increase in Asian floating storage. Now, the benefit at this point is we do have India at about 93% um, refinery utilization rates. 
This is up from about 75%. And it's it's twofold. It's one, things have gotten better on a COVID side. It is the festival season, so we have seen more activity. But it'll just be interesting to see if they can continue because India is a bright spot right now, which will help keep some of this Asian floating storage from getting too aggressive. But at some point, these super tankers will show up. They will get registered as, as storage. So these are important charts to look at together. And then as we just look at, you know, a quick wrap up on Singapore, you know, the Singapore oil products remain at seasonally adjusted all-time highs, you know, compliant LSLFO, which is just uh, light, uh, low sulfur fuel oil, fell about 93,000 tons, but they still remain at about 3.41 million. And it, it's just, there's still a significant amount. Now, this number looks worse than some of the different parts, and it's important to look at the two different pieces. Clearly, we're still at highs, but it's not all the same. So right now, you can see that middle distillate made a new all-time high, or at least right along, right along where we were back in, in August and September. And it's just important to understand that this trend is in a, moving in a negative direction, which is why it's important to look at middle distillate stock. And there can be some recracking opportunity here, but this is where we see some of the impacts and we're gonna have to see this get absorbed into the market. And could it go into India? Could it flow into Europe? You know, it, it's gonna be difficult to flow into Europe because obviously they're in their own shutdowns and lockdowns, but this is gonna have to start to find a home as get as light distillates which is a lot of gasoline has started to find a home so this is why there's a tale of two cities here so middle distillate continues to struggle which is the one that we look at from an in, from an industrial perspective but this is where we have a significant amount of gasoline that has been imported into Europe, which is then being shipped over into the US. So this is something that will also kind of weigh on where some of these numbers are. And putting all of this together, we continue to see how this is impacting overall US pricing. So US spot pricing has been under pressure. It's, it's hurting our export market because it's just getting difficult to compete in this market at this point in time, given Libya is supposed to be at a million barrels within the next you know two to three weeks. We already have OPEC that is that is up about 250,000 barrels a day in October. We'll get the official numbers as we go into November. And there's just additional volume that's coming into the market, especially when we look at Libya, when we look at Norway, you know, and some of these, and obviously the U.S. is... <laughs> We still have elevated commercial storage, and we've had three hurricanes. So, to can and we've had shutdowns, uh, sh you know, shut-ins, and all these other things, and yet we still are sitting here with um, with a significant amount in storage as refinery utilization rates remain under pressure. And just given some of these dynamics, we just don't see that changing, which is why we're not going to get this ramping surge of of uh, frac spread counts into the end of the year, just because it's going to be difficult to see it, you know, just given based on where the numbers are. So this is a, a quick recap. You know, we had a busy week. Uh, we did a lot in the EIA show. We had the three different segments. We had the five segments in the econ show. And then obviously we, we had a great conversation with Chris Bird, which uh, came out on Monday. Highly recommend listening to it. It's always great to hear it from a, from a reserve uh, engineer in terms of what they're seeing, what they're thinking, how they're hedging, what, is, uh, what do things look like going forward. So hopefully you have a great weekend. You know, hopefully uh, the, uh, the voting lines aren't too long for you or you've been lucky enough to vote by mail. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Thanks again.